you'll all please stand. We'll start the symposium by singing, O Heavenly King. You may be seated. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory it is my great pleasure to extend words of welcome to the distinguished scholars presenting at this first annual academic symposium at St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary. This has been a dream of our academic dean, Dr. Alex Tadoria the Peter N. Gramowicz Professor of Church History. And I want to thank him for making his dream a reality. Our Alexander Schmemann, Professor of Liturgical Theology, Deacon Vitaly Permiakov, along with his colleagues, have labored to create this symposium on the theme of liturgy and theology. This is a most appropriate theme for a first annual academic symposium at St. Vladimir Seminary, as this theological academy is surely the unquestioned epicenter of the study of liturgical theology in the Eastern Orthodox tradition. Liturgical theology is an academic field that is foundational for our seminary. Many of you will remember that 60 years ago, there was still a debate, a concern, that liturgical theology really did not belong in the academy. It was Proto-Presbyter Alexander Schmemann who described liturgical theology as the elucidation of the theological meaning of worship. He wrote in his introduction to liturgical theology, liturgical theology is therefore an independent theological discipline with its own special subject. The liturgical tradition of the church and requiring its corresponding and special methods distinct from the methods of other theological disciplines. So this evening we welcome our honored liturgical theologians, and our esteemed faculty and seminarians and our friends joining us in person or virtually this evening. I would now ask Deacon Vitaly Permiakov to introduce our speaker who will give our keynote address this evening, Deacon Vitaly. Good evening. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory it's a joy, a pleasure, and an honor to introduce the keynote speaker for our first academic symposium at St. Vladimir Seminary, Professor Dr. Reverend Maxwell Johnson, great scholar, an amazing teacher, the doctor father to many students, uh, including here present uh, Deacon Mark Rosin, uh, Father Stephanos Alexopoulos, uh, as well as I remember that Max, for since 2004, for a number of years, he had to deal with a strange character named Vitaly Permikov. 
And since I'm standing before you, well, you see that it was relatively successful. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, uh, Max Johnson received his doctorate from University of Notre Dame in 1992, uh, where he was a um, student of such great liturgical scholars, being students of such great liturgical scholars as Robert Taft, Gabriel Winkler, Paul Bradshaw. Um, his doctoral dissertation was on the Ecologion of Serapion of Tmuis. He taught in the Department of Theology of St. John's University from 93 to 97, and since 97 at his alma mater, University of Notre Dame, where since 2002 he holds the rank of Professor of Liturgical Studies. Max is the author of numerous important books and articles in the field of liturgical st studies, many of which are uh, used uh, and read uh, in many theology departments, uh, graduate theology departments, and uh, seminaries, including Orthodox seminaries. So I was very glad to hear when I mentioned to some of you present here, to some of the students present here, mentioned that Max Johnson is going to be our keynote speaker for our symposium. I immediately got, uh, there was an immediate name recognition, said, oh well, yes. Um, uh, your, the readings from his books were assigned and uh, judging by reaction, they were read. <laughs> so, uh, mm, um, <coughs> So Max is the author of 25 books and more than 90 articles and essays, including The Rights of Christian Initiation, Eucharistic Liturgies, Their Evolution Interpretation with uh, Paul Bradshaw, The Origin of uh, Feasts, Fasts, and Seasons in Early Christianity, uh, also with Paul Bradshaw, the uh, edition of uh, Aposto Traditio Apostolica, of Apostolic Tradition, um, Again, uh, those of you who are taking my LT-102 class, you've heard about that, doc, that, uh, that important source. <clears throat> and most recently, the introduction to Eastern Christian liturgies uh, with uh, Stephanos, uh, Father Stephanos Alexopoulos. Uh, Max is the past president of the North American Academy of Liturgy, where in 2021, he received the prestigious Beraka Award. He was ordained as pastor in 1978 by the Minnesota Synod of Lutheran Church in America, and in 2018 he was inducted as an honorary canon of the Cathedral of St. James in the Episcopal Diocese of Northern Indiana, as well as he had received many other uh, honors and awards. Finally, Mark, finally, Max is uh, renowned, also renowned, not only as scholar and pastor um, and a wonderful man, but also he, that he plays and sings as his own blues band and uh, the Oblates of the Blues. And uh, please uh, look it up on YouTube. Um, and, uh, uh, <clears throat> so uh, we are uh, very honored uh, to uh, greet Max uh, today and to welcome him as our keynote speaker. Please welcome Professor Max Johnson. I was wondering if he was going to stop. <laughs> but it's I who am honored and my profound gratitude for this invitation to come and address this, this symposium. And yes, Vitaly did make it through. <laughs> lots of emails, lots of conversations, but he made it, and I'm delighted. I first encountered Alexander Schmemann's work when, during a vacation trip to Canada in the summer of 1979, I purchased the second edition of his then already classic Introduction to Liturgical Theology, along with an icon of St. Nicholas at the book and gift shop of Holy Trinity Ukrainian Orthodox Metropolitan Cathedral in Winnipeg, Manitoba. I have to confess, however, that I didn't read it until I had to do so a few years later when it appeared on the 
required reading list for the 1982 MA Comprehensive Exam in Liturgical Studies at St. John's uh, School of Theology in Collegeville, Minnesota. I devoured the book with my own underlining and marginal notes often now hiding the text itself. And I have to confess that since then, I have returned to his theology frequently because I am still taken with his basic approach to the question of lex orandi, lex credende, which I would assert is much less speculative about either liturgy or theology than the approaches of some of his alleged disciples have been. So in this presentation, I wanna do three things. First, a general overview of Schmemann's approach, which I probably don't need to do with this group. But second, I will look at his use of the adage of lex orandi, which he says is always lex orandi, lex est credendi, which of course is not the original verb in that formula, but it's est credendi, and for him that makes the difference. In I wanna look at that in relationship to the classic use of that phrase in Prosper of Aquitaine's response, to the heresy of semi-Pelagianism. And then third, I want to explore some ecumenical implications. Uh, his theological approach, not just of course for Orthodox, but for both Catholics and Protestants, or at least contemporary Lutherans, in service of the future of liturgical theology. So first, lex orandi, lex est credendi. Father Schmemann, of course, devoted a number of his writings to the question, of the relationship between liturgy and theology. And according to him, neither liturgical theology as a sub-discipline within the broader field, nor the attempt to develop a the theology of liturgy from which we might deduce a program of liturgical reform um, are, are appropriate to this question. Rather, as he says, theology as the, quote, orderly and consistent presentation, explication, and defense of the church's faith must be rooted in the very experience of the faith itself, which is given and received in the church's liturgia, in her lex orandi. In other words, for Schmemann, the lex orandi is the church's lex credendi. And the theological task is ultimately a descriptive and interpretive process which attempts to grasp the theology uh, as revealed in and through the liturgy. He says, theology should not be reduced to liturgy, but all Christian theology should somehow be liturgical. That is, have its ultimate frame of reference in the faith of the church as manifested and communicated in the liturgy. So, what is it that in liturgy that makes liturgy this epiphany of the church's faith in such a way that it becomes this great source for theological reflection and discourse? For Schmemann, it's not simply a particular liturgy with its given texts, rubrics, acts, and interpretations, though all of these are included. It was rather what he called the liturgical ordo. The basic underlying structure and theology enshrined, even hidden, within the various uh, Byzantine ordinaries and typica. It was this unchanging principle, this living norm or logos of worship as a whole within what is accidental and or temporary. And this unchanging principle, norm, or logos presented by the Ordo, having apostolic and Judeo-Christian origins, is a particular understanding and revelation of the co-relationship of a normative eschatology, cosmology, and ecclesiology, which is manifested in the very core of the church's liturgical act, especially in the Eucharist. So, within 
the, the, the Lexa Rande of early Christianity, there was, according to him, quote, an organic, self-evident connection and interdependence of Lord's Day, Eucharist, and Ecclesia, or Ecclesia, coming together of the faithful as church, which manifested an eschatological, an ecclesiological, and a cosmological vision. He wrote, he says, it's clear on the one hand that this still exists liturgically, but it's equally clear on the other. It is neither understood nor experienced in the way it was understood and experienced then. Why? Because a certain theology and a certain piety shaped by that theology, by imposing their own categories, their own approach, changed our understanding of the liturgy and our experience of it. Nevertheless, if this still exists, this organic connection between world church and kingdom still exists liturgically, it's in and by means of the liturgy that the church is informed, he says, of her cosmical and eschatological vocation, receives the power to fulfill it, and becomes what she is the sacrament in Christ of the kingdom. And in this sense, the liturgy is indeed the means of grace. In the all-embracing meaning, as the means of always making the church what she is, a realm of grace, communion with God, of new knowledge and new life. So, so the experience, he continues, of new creation, the experience and vision of the kingdom which is to come, the icon of this reality. Now, so according to Schmemann, one does not seek to reform the liturgy, but to articulate and make clear the unchanging apostolic principle of the ordo contained and expressed therein. Since the church's lex orandi is the church's lex credendi, the task of theology is to explicate, explain, and defend that liturgically received vision and experience. But to say that, that one does not seek to reform the liturgy, doesn't mean that one doesn't seek to reform that theology and that piety shaped by that theology, which imposed its own categories and approach, which changed our understanding of liturgy and our experience of it. Deacon Nicholas Denisenko is a name I'm sure is familiar to, to many of you. Denisenko has demonstrated that in this area of theology and piety, which since the late fourth century was characterized in Schmemann's words by a mysteriological piety imposed on the liturgy, Schmemann was indeed in relationship to that a liturgical reformer, or at least involved directly in liturgical renewal, especially here at St. Vladimir's. While he was not involved with the creation of new Eucharistic prayers or a new lectionary, or even the revival of the catechumenate, which is coming, by the way, nor with what Denisenko uh, refers to as the excision of liturgical elements that had become ossified over the course of time, <laughs> But he was deeply involved with liturgical catechesis, with a Eucharistic revival, and at least regard uh, to more frequent and reception of Holy Communion, liturgical music, restoration of other rites, the service of general confession, the shifting of the liturgy of the pre-sanctified to evenings. Now that's something interesting. And not least, not least, with dependence on his teacher, Nicholas Afanasyev, translated, of course, by, by my student, um, the, understanding, the understanding of the laity as the concelebrant of the liturgy along with the bishop. And with this, the obvious necessity of what the West has come to call active participation. If not a reformer of the liturgy per se, he was certainly a reformer of the theology and piety which he believed 
had obscured the ordo. Okay, that's my first point. I don't know if I got it right or not, but we'll go with it. We'll ask Rosine if I got it right. Now, so Schmemann's approach to the question of Luxorandi and the relationship of, of the original phrase. It can be argued that in the most basic level, Schmemann's approach to the Luxorandi as a source for theology or believing parallels, I believe, closely the original use of this principle by Prosper of Aquitaine in his fifth century response to semi-Pelagianism. It still baffles me why a Russian Orthodox theologian would choose a Latin principle born in the heat of a distinctly Western doctrinal controversy, but it is. The fact of the matter is that both Schmemann and Prosper, the, the disciple of Augustine, both of them are concerned with the faith of the church as manifested in the liturgy. That is, like Augustine before him, Augustine always gets ignored here, who also appeals to liturgical prayer against Pelagianism and Augustine's principle that never caught on, maybe it's because it's tougher, ipsa igitur ratio clarissima est gratiae testificatio, or prayer itself is the clearest testimony of grace. Not a bad line. But Prosper uses the phrase ut legem credendi statuat lex supplicandi in relationship to other liturgical arguments in defense of the necessity of divine grace in human salvation. And those other arguments include the inviolable decrees of the blessed apostolic see, which our holy fathers have cast down, God, I love this language, have cast down the pride of this pestiferous novelty, semi-Pelagianism, and taught us to ascribe to the grace of Christ only the very beginnings of goodwill. Okay? So Prosper is no liturgical fundamentalist, but he indicates that liturgical prayer, the lex supplicandi in this case, the intercessions that ask for grace, basically in the Roman Rite Good Friday liturgy, is but one of several sources that he uses. Nevertheless, there are those contemporary liturgical theologians who approach the topic of Lex Arandi, Lex Credendi, as though the Lex Arandi is the only or primary or foundational theological source. Aidan Kavanaugh, for example, says this, Lex supplicandi is something much more specific than the broad and fuzzy notion of the practice of the church. It's the law of supplicatory prayer, not prayer worship in general, but prayer which petitions God for the whole range of human needs, a law of ecological petition. That's the nub of the reason why it founds and constitutes the lex credendi and is therefore primary for Christian theology. The way Christians believe is somehow constituted and supported by how Christians petition God for their human needs. Is that what Prosper says? Prosper's use of this principle is but another argument against semi-Pelagianism made in addition to the one based on the decrees of the apostolic see. And further, what gives the Lex Arandi authority is that the sacred testimony of the priestly intercessions had been transmitted from the apostles, in Prosper's opinion, and that they're uniformly celebrated throughout the world in every Catholic church. Of course, they're not, and they weren't, but th that's not the point. So the lex supplicandi could also be said to constitute the lex credendi, but not as an isolated norm or principle. It can function in this way because it conforms to the traditional and biblical doctrinal teaching of the church. In other words, Prosper's argument is a doctrinal one, doctrinal one, in which he uses liturgical evidence in addition to other evidence because that liturgical evidence is consistent with and illustrative of those other sources, namely scripture and tradition. A 
That's why it's an ut clause. You understand what clause is. So that, you know, says we've got this going on and this going on and this going on. And by the way, so that the liturgy itself might also be seen to function in this way. Okay? What Prosper does not say is that one of these sources is more important or more foundational or primary than the other. In fact, Prosper knows that the Lex Credendi itself is involved uh -oh, with shaping the Lex Orandi as well. This is a two-way street. In the words of Jesuit theologian Ed Kilmartin, the late Ed Kilmartin, he says, the slogan, law of prayer, law of belief, leaves in suspense which magnitude might be the subject and which is the predicate in particular instances. Consequently, it seems legitimate to state the axiom in this way. The law of prayer is the law of belief and life and vice versa. On the one hand, it implies a comprehensive and in some measure pre-reflective perception of the life of faith, but on the other hand, the law of belief must be introduced because the question of the value of a particular liturgical tradition requires the employment of theoretical discourse. One must reckon with the limits of the liturgy as lived practice of that faith. History has taught us that forms of liturgical prayer and ritual activity, however orthodox, often were changed to avoid heretical misunderstanding. So, might also note here the critique of the use of this Latin tag um, by Nathan Mitchell, one of my colleagues, retired now, but still going strong. Mitchell argues that the binary formula, lex orandi, lex credendi, though often invoked to assert the priority of doxology over doctrine, is in fact something of a red herring. The formula is flawed from the get-go because its reasoning is circular. We believe, it asserts, that the church's public prayer shapes what and how we believe. But such a statement already expresses fundamental convictions, beliefs about the nature both of Christ and the church, beliefs that make liturgy possible in the first place. So the slogan Lex Rondi Lex Credende does not then offer as much light as it may seem to promise. Okay, I think Schmemann's approach is, is much more faithful to Prosper's original use than is someone like Aidan Kavanaugh, who everybody thinks is just simply following Kavanaugh. Ah, Schmemann, excuse me, can't follow himself. Well, I don't know with Aidan, but as is, as is widely known, his influential thesis was that Prosper's phrase invites us to make a critical distinction between what Kavanaugh called primary liturgical theology, or he said it in Latin because it sounds better, theologia prima, okay? the liturgical assemblies um, experience, and secondary liturgical theology, theologia, theologia secunda, reflection on that experience, and the embodiment for Kavanaugh of that theologia practic prima practitioner was the creation of his now famous Mrs. Murphy. He says, the language of the primary theologian more often consists in symbolic, metaphoric, sacramental words and actions which throw flashes of light upon chasms of rich ambiguity. So Mrs. Murphy lang language, Mrs. Murphy's language illuminates the chaotic landscape through which I must pick my professional way with the laser-like beam of precise words and concepts. Though as I've said elsewhere, what's to keep Mrs. Murphy in her theologia prima experiential faith from becoming a heretic? Is it the liturgy that really shapes her? Or is it more, as others have said, various forms of popular piety, which are not necessarily liturgical? Well, but more importantly, Kavanaugh goes on to say that belief is always consequent upon encounter with the source of the grace of faith. I agree with that. But he says, therefore, Christians do not worship because they believe. They believe because the one in whom 
in whose gift faith lies is regularly met in the act of worship. Is that really the case? One of the things that always struck me deeply when reading Schmemann's on liturgical theology for the first time and ever since was his often forgotten critique of the Mysterian Lera approach of Dom Odo Caso, whom others had rightly critiqued as reducing Christianity to another Greco-Roman mystery cult, though of course the biggie, the big, the right Greco-Roman mystery cult. Listen to what Schmemann says, and I don't, I don't hear this very often. He says, Christianity was preached as a saving faith, not as a saving cult. In it, the cult was not the object of faith, but its result. Historians have not sufficiently emphasized that the cult had no place in the preaching of Christianity. It's not even mentioned in its kerygma. This is so because at the center of the Christian kerygma, there is the proclamation of the coming of the Messiah and a call to believe in this as having saving significance. The cult is only the realization, the actualization of what the believer has already attained by faith. And the whole significance is the fact that it leads into the church, the new people of God created and brought into being by faith. Robert Taft, a true disciple of, of Schmemann, has argued that liturgy in the narrow sense of the word, actual Christian liturgies, is one, one privileged ground of the divine encounter, one theophany or revelation of God's saving presence. It is by no means the only ground of this encounter, because God does not depend on our liturgy to meet us and call us to him. And further, basic to all presences of the risen Christ in his church is his presence in faith. Prior to faith, it's the presence of the Spirit, for faith is rooted in the action of the Spirit, which makes faith possible and through which Christ is present. Hence, even if faith is continually celebrated, expressed, reaffirmed, and renewed in the liturgy, the opposite of Kavanaugh's statement can be made. Christians may indeed worship because they believe and wish to believe more. Or it's been said elsewhere, the first act of faith is prayer. Continual participation in the liturgical experience continues to be formative for the faith and life of those already initiated, and Schmemann's overall approach remains like that of Prosper, and even the contemporary British Methodist theologian Jeffrey Wainwright, a most helpful approach to the question of the relationship between liturgy and doctrine. Indeed, lex orandi, lex est credende, reminds us that what the church believes, teaches, and confesses will certainly be expressed, reflected within its worship, even if we grant, and of course we have to, that the language of liturgy is always more poetic, symbolic, and metaphorical than doctrinal or dogmatic. But that does not mean that it is not doctrinally significant. Now, it might be argued, and I would, um, argue that what Schmemann describes is exactly what Prosper was trying to do in his own context, to explicate and defend liturgically the faith of the church. Here in this context, as it was related to the primacy and priority of grace in the process of salvation. Like Schmemann, what Prosper articulates does indeed have its ultimate term of reference in the faith of the church as manifested and communicated in the liturgy. So if you want to understand any religious tradition, you have to not just read its theological and doctrinal texts, you have to study its worship. Because it's not a question of, oh, maybe the, the experience of worship grounds our faith. No. You want to read the faith of any given body? Look at what they do in worship. 
For those outside the church, for example, liturgy did not and could not function as anyone's primary theology or even as a direct tool for evangelism or conversion like a lot of the TV evangelists want to do today, though what they call worship somewhat bothers me. People did not generally become Christian because they somehow experienced the new creation, the experience and vision of the kingdom which is to come in the church as worship because they weren't allowed in to the church's worship. You see? They didn't believe because of the liturgy. Rather, as Mennonite scholar Alan Kreider has written, Christian worship was designed to enable Christians to worship God. It was not designed to attract non-Christians. It was not (laughs) seeker-sensitive, modern term, for seekers were not allowed in. Christian, that's why you have big bodyguards, sometimes called doorkeepers, you know, in antiquity. Christian worship assisted in the outreach of the churches indirectly as a byproduct. How? By shaping the lives and character of individual Christians and their communities so that they would be intriguing. What was available for others who found Christianity intriguing was the catechumenate, which by the end of the fourth century functions not only on moral formation and discipleship, but clearly if you read the mystagogical catechesis and the pre-baptismal catechesis of someone like Cyril of Jerusalem, oh, I think I did a book on those here, um, functioning also on doctrine, on creed. His 18 uh, pre-baptismal lectures have five on general things, and I can't keep my count, 13, 14 on the creed, right? People didn't shy away. So, so, even, but here, this is another point, even to enter the catechumenate required initial, (coughs) initial conversion and faith. Faith is, faith is uh, coming the big one here, okay? which, of course, is nourished, sustained, expressed, further developed, and so on and so forth in the liturgy, but not just there. Okay, okay so I'm, I'm, I think I'm doing okay time-wise. I'm moving to now part three, the ecumenical implications. Liturgical, Lutheran liturgical theologian, we do have a couple, um, Michael Auni, who's now retired professor of worship at Pacific Lutheran, at the Graduate Theological Union in California, Berkeley, has been a staunch critic of what he calls the Schmemann, Lathrop, Kavanaugh, Fagerberg line of liturgical theology. I don't think, I don't think Schmemann should be included in that. Um, and has said that the time today is now ripe for a new line. Oni argues that what is needed is less focus on the community, the assembly, or even liturgy as communal action, an approach he believes characterizes that school, and he thinks we need better theological conversation on what it is that God does in liturgy. Focusing on God's self-communication, and as a result, emphasizing the divine agency and initiative. He finds compatibility here with contemporary um, Roman Catholic liturgical theology, a theologian, Kevin Irwin at Catholic U, who has written, liturgy is primarily, that's deliberate I think, about what God does among us and for us. All that we do in the liturgy is but a response to the overarching grace-filled initiative of God. I sometimes also wonder whether emphasizing what we do in liturgy is a particularly American phenomenon and preoccupation. He says the phrases of the Eucharistic prayer should ring in our ears as continual reminders of what God does. Again and again, you gather a people to yourself. Those who worship comprise the family you have gathered here before you. He's referring to some contemporary Roman Eucharistic prayers. He says there's a delicate balance in liturgy. 
a divine initiative and a human response, the action of God, the sanctification of, the hum of humanity. But how we achieve this is part and parcel of liturgy as art and craft. Even then, it's not about what we achieve, but what God works among us and through us. Okay, in addition to this, Auni calls, excuse me, Auni calls for more up-to-date grasp and use of historical liturgical scholarship among liturgical theologians today. In so doing, he echoes Paul Bradshaw's critique that much of contemporary liturgical theology often treats a selective reading of especially liturgical, patristic liturgical sources um, um, and reconstructed rites. It's not so far a, a, an Eastern problem yet, but it's constituting a kind of normative golden age of liturgy in which you know, contemporary Protestants and Catholics are basically able to ignore both medieval and Reformation developments because they must be aberrations. Bradshaw has suggested liturgical theology then needs, quote, to abandon its tendency to rest upon bad history or no history at all, and instead to take the fruits of historical research with um, much, more, much more seriously. Now, Aoni draws particular attention here to liturgical historians like Bradshaw, Gabriella Winkler, at whose name Bob Taft used to say, every knee should bow. Taft and yours truly. Not, not that you should bow to us, um, only Winkler, in his call to take liturgical historical scholarship with more seriousness. And he points us to alternative contemporary theologians like Erwin, Reinhard Messner, um, uh, 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 Reinhard, yes, and then um, Reinhold Malcherik, Ed Kilmartin, and others in support on this emphasis of focusing on God's activity. I've argued elsewhere that I have strong sympathies with Aoni's concern, but I question whether or not Schmemann should be included among the reformers, I'm sorry, the theologians that he critiques, apart from the fact that they all may wish to claim him. Actually, Schmemann, like Taft, relativized the liturgy, relativized the cult, saying, remember, the cult is only the realization, the actualization of what the believer has already attained by faith, and its whole significance is in the fact that it leads into the church. Or as Taft has said, can't get more basic than this, the liturgy of the new covenant is Jesus Christ. He is our liturgy. Christian liturgy, he continues, in the Pauline sense, is that same reality, Jesus Christ in us. Now, even Auni's concern for taking liturgical history more seriously finds its corollary in Schmemann. While his appeal to liturgical history might be today limited to earlier historical liturgical scholarship, some far surpassed today, Schmemann's approach was indeed strongly historical. And his introduction to liturgical theology, in fact, reads as much as a study in liturgical history as it does in liturgical theology, properly speaking. And he certainly does not write off medieval and later developments as aberrations. Again, it's Taft, who has referred to the necessity of a historical approach for liturgical theology. You may have heard this or read this. Tradition is not the past. It is the church's self-consciousness now of that which has been handed on to her, not as an inner treasure, but as a dynamic inner life. Theology must be a reflection on the whole of that reality, the whole of tradition, and not just its present manifestations. One of the great contemporary illusions is that we can construct a liturgical theology with a without a profound knowledge of the liturgical tradition. So in spite of the, to me, he says, rather perplexing discomfort that many Americans seem to have with history, there can be no theology without it, end quote. 
Schmemann knew that and certainly articulated the, uh, the necessity of articulating the whole tradition. Okay, okay, okay. What have I got? Oh, I've got a, I've got a few minutes yet. Huh, Vitaly? Okay. Now, it is Schmemann's idea of the ordo of Christian liturgy that seems to have generated a lot of ecumenical interest in our own day and age. And at least in Lutheran circles, this is most closely associated with the work of Gordon Lathrop, who has made the concept of the ordo his primary methodological principle. On the basis of the Emmaus account in Luke 24, Justin Martyr's description of the baptismal and Sunday Eucharist in his first apology, the liturgical definition of uh, the church in the Lutheran confessions as the assembly of saints among whom the gospel is preached in its purity and the holy sacraments are administered according to the gospel. Lathrop has proposed what he has been viewed as an ecumenical, transcultural, possibly even apostolic, though he doesn't want to go that far, authoritative ordo for Christian worship. Reducing it to the essentials. Well, what are those essentials? I got some long quotes, you can read about them later, but, or read them later, but bottom line is the essentials of Christian worship is that a community gathers, it's the first big word in prayer, it listens to the word, namely the, the scriptures, it shares the meal, and it's sent on mission to serve. Okay? So, this articulation has had far-reaching um, influence among contemporary Lutherans. Ecumenical conversations, too, in providing a kind of structural model of gathering word, meal, and sending. So, what is this? I, as I've tried to point out elsewhere, an ordo or pattern, apart from its doctrinal, cultural, and even textual expressions in actual liturgies, doesn't exist. It's a logical construct. Something Lathrop deduces or abstracts from already existing liturgies. The problem is, those already existing liturgies themselves concretize precisely the doctrinal, cultural, creedal, and even textual expressions of the church's faith that the liturgy exists to serve. In other words, there is no ordo up there, some kind of timeless platonic ordo, apart from the ways in which gathering word, meal, and sending actually happens. John Baldwin has argued that in order to fully understand a particular liturgy, in addition to this core pattern, we also need to know what he calls both code and culture. The code, huh? The ways in which that core is um, expressed, and the culture in, when it t in which it takes place. Now, these are often lacking, and so it's kind of a dangerous approach. Okay. So is this Schmemann's understanding of Ordo? No, no it is not. And I think there's a big difference because for Schmemann the order is not some kind of, as I said, almost platonic ideal fo um, form which a variety of expressions in multiple ways might image, au contraire. For Schmemann there is no Ordo apart from the concrete liturgies themselves. In his case, the Byzantine rite, the classic liturgy of his tradition. The unchanging principle, the ordo, is the unchanging principle, the living norm or logos of worship within that which is accidental or temporary. Those are his words. So if, if we can view Lathrop's ordo as platonic, oh, Schmemann's ordo might be Aristotelian. Okay? That is, the ordo is the theological substance within the accidents of the liturgy itself, but you don't get at the substance without the accidents, unless you want to transubstantiate them, and I don't think anybody in this room does. <laughs> the lack of liturgical specificity in Lathrop's approach has been the subject of critique again. And again, we go back to Auni. 
He's challenged the, the theological and ritual assumptions um, in contemporary Lutheran resources influenced by Lathrop's Ordo, including the most recent uh, Evangelical Lutheran Church in America worship book, Evangelical Lutheran Worship, saying, quote, there is the assumption that since the appearance of this book, that because there's this basic and general ordo, preparers of worship need not be constrained by the confessional and liturgical tradition of Lutheranism or the Western Church, you see? Or further, one might note that the Lutheran confessions themselves reflect not some kind of normative liturgical ordo or pattern, apart from the theological primacy of word and sacrament, but are very clear that what is at stake liturgically is the Mass, the Eucharistic liturgy of the Western Church. The Augsburg Confession says it this way, our churches are falsely accused of abolishing the Mass. Actually, the Mass is retained among us and is celebrated with the greatest reverence. Almost all the customary ceremonies are also retained, uh, except that the German hymns are interspersed here and there among the parts sung in Latin. <laughs> yeah, there's not a Lutheran congregation in this country that you could make that statement about. And so I gave a talk saying, have we abolished the Mass as, as Lutherans? Well, some of us haven't. But in any event, while the Mass might take place in different ways, different languages, it's still the Mass as a given, an object, an already existing reality like English literature in the words of Taft that was the concern here of the reformers. Not simply some kind of pattern, but the liturgical Eucharistic tradition of the West with its Kyrie, Gloria, Credo, Sanctus, and Agnus Dei together with lectionary readings, prayers, and other chants. Ordo, in terms of how Lathrop has presented it, doesn't get us too far. Though he's a dear man, one of my former teachers also. So where do we go? Here's my conclusion. I'll be quick. Liturgical theology and liturgical theologians alike owe a great deal to Schmemann's liturgical theology. Whether he has always been appropriated or interpreted correctly or not is another question. But his lasting influence is clear both in terms of his use of the principle lex orandi, lex escredendi, and his articulation of the eschatological, ecclesiological, and Eucharistic ordo as the very substance of the church's lex orandi. Whatever the future of liturgical theology may be, his theology will and should continue to play an important role because so many of his, um, his um, agenda items, you might say, for liturgical renewal of the Eucharist, catechesis, and maybe above all, the baptismal dignity of the faithful remain unfinished business for us all. And together with this, I'm in agreement with Auni that liturgical theology needs to move beyond what he's called this, again, I'm gonna say about, more about this in a second, Schmemann, Lathrop, Kavanaugh, Fagerberg line, which I'm not sure by lumping them together anyway is helpful. But as we've seen, what Auni actually criticizes is the perception that the liturgical theology of this school focuses too much on community and not on divine action. What is it God does in liturgy? What is it on specifically focusing on God's self-communication? re-emphasizing the divine agency and initiative, I would say that's part of the ordo. That's part of the theology enshrined, you see, in that liturgy. And it's clear here that in spite of the popularity of that school or line, um, um, we, we might note those theologians who have been referred to like Wainwright, Chap, Kilmartin, and Irwin, and perhaps it's time to suggest a new school of thought or liturgical theology. A Taft, Kilmartin, Irwin, Auni line, to which we could add several others, including 
Bishop M. Daniel Findikian, who was supposed to be here tonight, I told him since he couldn't make it, I wasn't gonna quote him, but um, who talks about, in an essay called The Unfailing Word in Eastern Sacramental Prayers, who underscores that the word proclaimed in liturgy and sacraments is central, since the sacrament itself is the proclamation of the word based on a specific promise of the Lord. Do this, baptize, you see? Similarly, Roman Catholic liturgical theologian, Louis-Marie Chauvet, um, always reminds me of uh, Maurice Chevalier, Saint Kevin, no. In any event, um, that's we, you don't get that, do you? I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's what my, my students, I just go, all right, listen, if you're going to take a class from me, here are the movies you need to watch. Here are the songs, because I'm going to refer to them. If you don't get them, tough. Okay. But in any event, Chauvet reminds us that, quote, the sacraments are nothing but a particular modality of the word. What was Augustine? Sacraments are visible words. Yeah. We see something. We see something liturgically. We don't only re receive something. Okay. Well, it's always then, but I should say, perhaps it's Nathan Mitchell. I'm just about done. I'm going to be done at eight. It's good. Um, who puts the emphasis exactly where it should be in contemporary liturgical theology when he says, liturgy is God's work for us, not our work for God. There's an issue. Only God can show us how to worship God. Fittingly, beautifully. Liturgy isn't something beautiful we do for God, but something beautiful God does for us and among us. Public worship is neither our work nor our possession. As the rule of St. Benedict reminds us, it is opus dei. Not the wacko outfit, but the historic work of God in, in the rule. Nathan was a former Benedictine. So it's Opus Dei, God's work. Our work is to feed the hungry, to refresh the thirsty, clothe the naked, care for the sick, shelter the homeless, visit the imprisoned, to welcome the stranger, open our hearts and hands to the vulnerable and the needy. If we're doing those things well, liturgy and the Christian identity it rehearses will all very likely take care of themselves. Whether there should be a new line of liturgical theology or not. Perhaps, you know, Taft, Kilmard, and Irwin, Auni line. One thing is crystal clear. Alexander Schmemann belongs in that line also, as much as he appears to be in the other. And I would submit that this was, or is, his genius and the sheer impossibility of fitting him into one school of thought or interpretation over another. I thank you for your attention. Uh, that, that's going to be it now, okay? <clears throat>